Today we're going to talk about a ministry of convenience. A ministry of convenience. Beginning in verse 18, Matthew chapter 20, Matthew chapter 8. Now when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave a, a commandment to depart unto the other side. And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said unto him, Follow me and let the dead bury their dead. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the ability to understand it, to be able to take it in. Because, Lord, we know that it is spiritual meat and milk for us. It's a means for us to grow, Lord. It's a means for us to understand more about you, who you are, what you expect of us. Lord, thank you for this precious word because by it, faith was created in us, that kind of faith that brought about salvation. Fill me afresh with your spirit this morning. Uh, help me to be the preacher, teacher that I need to be. And above all else, Father, I pray that you would get the glory. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Everyone that trusts Christ as their Savior should be willing to say, as this scribe did, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Why would we not say that realizing how much He has done for us? Following Christ means being led to the best place for us. The great tragedy is that many Christians are much like the scribe. He uh, as we shall point out later, while the scribe made that statement, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. He really had not counted the cost in terms of suffering and inconvenience. Anyone but for sure the believer must realize that following Christ, wherever he wants them to be, requires, requires denial often of things we count so dear to our lives down here. So often we forget that this world is not our home. And that we ought to be seeking those things which are above. Far too many of us spend many hours laboring for those things that are only temporal at best. We spend thousands of dollars on things that bring us comfort, but are unwilling to be spent for Him. We spend our money, our time, and our talent fixing something that broke and a little time reaching out to people who live broken lives of the many of whom are lost and their lives near the end of destruction. In Luke's Gospel chapter 4 and verse 18, we read these. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. 
Friend, listen. If you say, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go, rest assured that the major part will be that of reaching out to people who need his spiritual healing but will require on your part some inconvenience. Now, I've done something different today I thought I'd never do. This is a much shorter outline. I say that, maybe I shouldn't say anything. I don't know. But anyway, listen very carefully. Point number one. Following Christ whithersoever he went. Following Christ whithersoever he went. The willingness on the part of the scribe to outright say, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. That scribe, as someone else has rightly stated, was breaking with his fellow scribes by publicly declaring his willingness to follow Jesus. Now, I believe in public declarations, beloved. I don't think a Christian should be secret about what he does. Now, watch this. Scribes were learned people in the law, often lawyers. Now, they were also those who did all that they could to discredit Jesus. Turn to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22. Matthew Gospel, chapter 22. I want to do this because I want you to see at least at some point what appears to be somewhat of an awesomeness on the part of this scribe. But in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22, and reading beginning at verse uh, uh, 35, says, uh, Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is likened to it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now here it was a scribe whose only purpose in speaking to Jesus was to discredit him. It says uh, he came uh, tempting him. Now, let's go back, if you will, to this scribe in Matthew chapter 8. However, we see in Jesus' response to that scribe who said, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest, that he had not considered the cost. Now, the reason why Jesus answered in the fashion that he did, about the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, is because Jesus understood that this man had not totally considered what would be required of him if he followed Christ like he said he wanted to do. So Jesus' answer to the scribe found in Matthew 8.20 and also in Luke 9 and 58 were no doubt words that caused the scribe to have second thoughts about following Christ. Now, we have no details of what happened later. Neither in Luke's Gospel nor here. Which leads us to think 
he probably turned away. Jesus said in Matthew 8 and verse 20, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Those words, Son of Man, I want you to write this down, was the name Jesus used for himself more than any other. Even though Jesus was and is the Son of God. He used that name 83 times in the Gospels. 83 times. It was a messianic title. Look at Daniel's Gospel chapter 7 and verses 13 through 14. Daniel 7 uh, verses 13 through 14. In Daniel 7, begin at verse 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man uh, came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion and glory and the kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve Him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in His kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. That's Christ's second coming. The word Son of Man speak of Christ's humanity and humility. And yet it also speaks of His everlasting glory. Look at Matthew chapter 24 and verse 27. Matthew 24 and verse 27. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, Jesus Christ, that one who was 100% man, while at the same time 100% God, liked to relate Himself to mankind. But in such a way as mankind could see Him relate to them. Folks, you have the Son of God, the Holy God, the altogether righteous One relating to man who has a lot of problems. Now, the fact is whether in Jesus' time or in ours, people love that which is convenient. I do. I like it that, uh, and I'm not speaking against you people who still cut wood, but I got to tell you, I like going up and turning the thermostat. I like being able to go to the sink and turn the spigot on to get a drink of water. I like having an indoor private. There are a lot of things that we could talk about that are convenient. When Christ said that foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, He was pointing out that even animals have more adequate and permanent provisions than Jesus did. Jesus had no permanent residence, no permanent dwelling place while here on the earth. How many married couples, first thing they start thinking about as they're about to be married is, 
where are we going to live? Where are we going to live? He had not a settlement or a place of his own, not even a pillow of his own on which to lay his head. Jesus was literally at the mercy of those who would show him hospitality. No wonder his words to the twelve as he sent them out to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Turn with me to Matthew's Gospel chapter 10 and I want to read to you verses 6 through 14. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses, nor script for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves. For the workman is worthy of his meat. And into whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy. And these and there abide till you go thence. And when you come into a house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return unto you. And whosoever shall not receive you nor hear your words when you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Christ was telling them in verses 9 through 12 that as they went out, not to take with them that which would supply their needs. Why? I'm going to supply your needs. That's what he was saying. I want you to be more concerned with why I'm sending you than with what you need in terms of living. But rather, they would be provided for as they diligently, diligently uh, sought the lost. A significant urgency on their part in reaching the lost. These twelve went out by faith. Christ's words to the scribe who would follow him where he needed to count the cost. The cost would be equally that of suffering and inconvenience. We do not hear either in Matthew 8 or Luke 9 any response on the part of the scribe having heard Jesus' words we do hear from another disciple. Look at Matthew chapter 8 and verse 21. And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Those words unto him, let me first go and bury my father does not mean, listen, write it down, does not mean that his father was dead or anywhere close to being dead. It's an age-old problem that exists with all of God's children, especially when it comes to relatives. Now listen very carefully. Before you jump the gun, and think that Jesus was harsh because his response in verse 22 says, follow me and let the dead bury their dead. He said, let the, the uh, spiritually dead bury those that have died. You need to go and do what I've called you to do. Now, listen 
very carefully for a moment here. The man's father was not only not dead, but most likely would remain alive for some years. His excuse, let me pause for a moment. You know, many of us have lots of excuses for why we don't do things. Sometimes I think if we just stop and listen to ourselves, we would say, that's crazy on my part to use that excuse. But we do, don't we? His excuse points to the stronghold that family have on one who would follow Christ. A convenience convenience that we so like that turns us away from doing what Christ wants. Turn to Luke's Gospel chapter 14. Luke's Gospel chapter 14. I want to read to you beginning at verse 26. Jesus said, If any man come to me, and we could easily insert the words, if any man follow me. And hate not his father, and mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, and his own life also. He cannot be my disciple. And whosoever has does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he has sufficient to finish it, lest happily, after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him. Look at me for a moment. I wonder how many people professing Christians were unwilling or have been unwilling to go to the mission field. Why? Because I'll have to leave mom and dad thousands of miles away. That's an inconvenience. I wonder how many Christians that God has spoken to their heart, even called them into the ministry, but because of the fact that they could make more money doing something else, they chose not to go into the ministry. There are lots of things that we could bring up that are things that have to do more with convenience than they do anything else. Watch this. In this passage, Luke 14, begin at verse 26. In this passage, Christ sets forth in great detail the cost that must be counted if you decide to follow Him where He goes. First, you must love Him more than anyone else, even your closest family members. For how many of us does that one come home to? Oh, how sad. You cannot be a true disciple of His if you fail in this matter. That's what He's teaching. Second, you have to have 
a willingness to suffer. Look at verse 27 again. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Christ had a cross, didn't he? On that cross, Jesus Christ suffered in a way that you and I will never know. Because Christ's suffering on that cross, I don't doubt for a moment, was more than physical. Watch this. Those who follow Christ are to follow His example of a cross. Now, our cross is not the kind in which we are nailed to it in a sense to die for the sins of someone else because killing us wouldn't do a thing for salvation of people. But all of us have some kind of a cross, some area where we're going to have to suffer if we're really going to follow Him. And the sad thing is, so many people are unwilling to do that. On that cross, He suffered. True disciples have a cross to bear similar to His. Third, you need to realize before you start that you have sufficiency to finish. Verse 28. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counts the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? May I tell you that a good many people that go to the mission field come home? Did you know that? They had good intentions. There's no doubt that God called them, but you know what? At some point they said, I can't endure it. Really? You know, when I hear somebody say I can't endure it, I think that person doesn't know my Jesus. Come on! You know what? If we have the kind of trust in Him that we ought to have, we can, as the Scriptures teach, endure all things. Might not be easy, We'll go a few minutes and look at the Apostle Paul's testimony about some of the things that he had to endure. But Paul teaches us by example the things that a true Christian can endure if they're willing. Now, no one ever wants to start anything that they'll never finish. Point two, point two. Following Christ, whithersoever he goes, or for that matter, sins, requires a passion for Christ. We must not only love him more than anyone else, or anything else, but with all of our heart, mind, and soul, as we read, in Matthew 22, 37. When we love someone with all of our heart, it is amazing what we will give or do for that person. I think back to the days when I dated my wife. Uh, the biggest part of me dating my wife required me to drive seven and a half hours on weekends one way and one way back do i like driving today no not that many hours it's amazing what we're willing to do because we love someone i believe that most of us here today if not all who are married or even unmarried for that matter, would give our life for our spouse or our children, maybe even our parents. Love is a very strong motive for doing many things. We would even inconvenience ourselves to do so.
But while we might inconvenience ourselves for others, will we do the same for Christ? How far are we willing to go or do for Christ before we act as though it's not worth it? Will we tell others about Christ when we know that such an act is prohibited? That one's been around a long time. How do you know that? Turn to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. I want you to see Peter's response. By this time in Peter's life, he has certainly come a long ways. But in Acts chapter 5, and beginning at verse 28, and we'll read 28 and 29. Acts chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. Saying, Did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in his name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter said, and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than man. You know, in our country right now, it's becoming more and more clear that in certain places, you're not going to talk about Jesus. What does that mean for you, Christian? How far are you willing to go? I'll tell you what I think. I dare say most people would rather have their job than a witness. Hmm. Maybe you said, you know, you're getting a little too close, Pastor. Am I telling the truth or not? We don't like to lose our jobs. We don't like people not to like us. To tell you the truth, if we're honest with ourselves, we like fitting in more than we do anything. You think Peter was concerned about fitting in when he said that? I don't think so. By the way, they just got out of jail. God delivered them. It was a shock to the men that came to see him because they didn't understand how to get out. You know what the Bible says? With God all things are possible. God has done things in the lives of people that often the people themselves have to back up for a moment and marvel. How did He do that? I've been there a time or two. I'm sure some of you have. Watch this. Following Christ and doing His will for our lives is never a ministry of convenience. Most of you in here have read farther in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 10 than I went this morning. Because after having sent them, he took a little while and he spoke to them about what they could expect. It was the kind of thing that would scare some people off. Jesus wanted them to know, this is what you're up against. This is what's going to happen if you go. You're going to suffer. You're going to be hated of all men. <clears throat> you're going to be faced with the fact that you might die the fear of death cometh on you. But you know what he said in that passage? Don't fear him who is able to destroy the body. Fear him who is able to destroy both the soul and body in hell. That's why we have to have a healthy fear of God. 
A healthy fear of God makes us go on and do what we're supposed to do when it's extremely inconvenient to do so. Notice something about the Apostle Paul when it came to serving Christ. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 27. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 27. In weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. How many of you love to be tired? Stick your hand up. I just want to see if there's a crazy one in here. I don't like being tired. I listened to an advertisement on there that talks about some kind of a medicine that can help you, Carolyn. The guy says, I'm 55, but I think I'm 35. I'm thinking. <laughs> I don't know about those advertisements. I think they're a bit of an exaggeration, don't you? I have to admit, uh, at 74, I'm still trying to do the things that I did at 45 and it don't work. But I'm okay. I don't like to be tired. I find myself sitting in a chair falling asleep these days at times. I used to think, how could my father-in-law do that? What was that, Lincoln? What was that muttering back there? Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Notice, if you will, he says, in hunger and thirst. Paul apparently did without something sufficient to eat from time to time. Boy, we think it's a sin that the cupboards are empty, don't we? Notice he says in cold and nakedness. What is he talking about? Without sufficient clothing. Boy, all of us hunters, let me pick on us for a moment. We like our clothing, don't we? Those nice heated jackets. Paul didn't have a heated jacket, did he? Watch this. Watch this. It involved persecution. Look at verses 24 and 25. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day have I been in the deep. Paul suffered many things. But you know what? If you go to the last chapter of the book of 2 Timothy, he records for us, I finished what you called me to do. I'm paraphrasing. I finished it. That should be something every one of us in here are able to say. We should not have to stand before Jesus and say one day, well, you know what, Lord, I would have done it. I just think it was too much for me. Convenience while we live in this world may be something we're not ready to part with but what about meeting Jesus at the Bema Seat of Christ? Will we so love this world and the things that are in it that we go to Him empty handed? Will we one day stand before Him and make excuses like the one who only had one talent and went and hid it. And our Lord didn't have very good words to say to him, did he? What kind of words will he have to say to you? Close your Bibles and look at me for a moment. 